and welcome back to the only show we host here on Watchbox Reviews. This is Watches Live. Tonight, the theme is the Ultra Haute de Gamme. I've got a couple of bargain watches, but I have to admit, one of them is a watch I'm going to give to you, so it's not really part of the show. All the heavy hitters are on the table tonight. Longa, Paddock. We've got the likes of... F.P. Journe, we've got Jager Lecoult, Precious Metal Divers, can you believe the likes? Annual calendars, chronographs, regulators, striking watches, it's all here tonight. And we may as well start with one of the heaviest of the heavy hitters. This is the Zeitwerk Striking. The original Zeitwerk came out in 2009, it was a revelation. It's tri-digital display with hours, minutes, and tens of minutes, simply challenged people's notions and even transformed conceptions of what Longa could represent. Now, I'm happy to say this one right here is ready to jump, so we may as well... Did you hear that, guys? That is the Zeitwerk striking. It strikes the quarters, it strikes the hours. It is not a minute repeater, and it's not the decimal repeater, but it has a lovely tone, and the double strikers, both for the hours, one for the quarters, actually sound against a black polished gong that surrounds the dial. Now on the case back, of course, it's based on the now legendary L043. You've got the Raymontoir system, you've got a Maltese cross stop works for when the barrel runs down, you've got an air brake built into the mechanism, you've got a double third wheel and a hairspring, and you've got a free sprung balance beaten away at 18,000. Traditional watchmaking at its best and beautifully hand finished. Freehand engraved escape wheel cock, freehand engraved balance cock, gorgeous perlage, glossuta stripes, all of it in a golden, untreated German silver, nickel copper zinc alloy. This is the Zeitwerk striking. And you know what? I'm going to give you twice as much tonight, so I hope you're ready for it. Coming right back at you with the original Zeitwerk, this one in a gloriously warm rose gold. Let's take a look at the original 42 millimeter case. The one I just showed you was 44.3. Now this is the original size, 49 millimeters lug to lug, so I can actually wear this one on my wrist. You see, same fireworks, just without the sound of the striking mechanism. And if you're wondering what the Zeitwerk striking sounds like, I'm actually gonna give you a quick sample. It's always there when you want it on demand. It doesn't just sound on the quarters and the hours. You also get to play God, so to speak, and shoot time forward. Now, another way your watch can talk to you is if it has an alarm. And we may as well get that part over with first because, let's face it, it's an alarm watch you're waiting to hear. This is the Jager Lecoult Master Compressor Memovox, a very special piece. Let me see if I can find this. From 2002, they made 250 pieces in platinum, and this is one of them. I'm right on the cusp of it, guys. The nice thing about this watch, if I can ever figure it out, <laughs> I'll show you what it looks like first. For some reason, I'm a little bit blind tonight, my eyes are blurry, but this is the master compressor Memovox, blue dial, platinum case, a couple of things stand out here. First, you've got 100 meters of water resistance, and you've got a compressor crown system that requires only one half turn. Now it's 100 meters water resistant. Now it's ready to be wound and set. 41.5 millimeters in platinum. Back then, it was a deep platinum case profile with a solid platinum case back, and the usual gold medallion, the master control medallion on these, has been omitted for a solid platinum piece. Also, because these were made in 2002, back when JLC still used its second generation single fold clasp, you got a full platinum clasp when you bought a platinum watch. After 2005, they used the double folding clasp, and when you bought a platinum JLC, you got a double folding white gold clasp. This is the way it should be, and it's the main reason why this 41 millimeter watch feels like it weighs as much as a 44 on the wrist. Now, there is more to it. There's an internal bi-directional rotating dive bezel, so if you do want to line this one up with the minute hand, you've got a quick impromptu zero to 60 minute chronograph. And I absolutely adore the fact that this watch can basically be a do it all because as heavy as it is, it's not that big. We have one more stab at getting the alarm to sound. I filmed the video for this one. Watch, I probably forgot to, to wind it or something. Yeah, that's it. I forgot to wind it. There we go. 
I wound it up while I was talking to you. Sorry about that, guys. It'll sound for about 25 seconds when it's fully wound. That's the caliber 918 right there. Okay, guys, let's see who's in the chat box tonight. I can see Edward Ledden from Sweden, Tom P., Simon Holt, Mozart Rabai, Mike K., Eddie Landsberg, Russell 996, Matt Foster, Jason Reeves, Watch Doctor, High and Rising, Bob Rouleau, Anthony O., Andre Gutierrez, and I can see Haute Ologerie joining us just now. Guys, thank you so much for joining in. Let me show you what I'm going to give you for free. We haven't quite started the raffle yet. It's going to be for the month of August. We're going to do a three-week raffle of an Audi Sport-inspired Oris Arctix Audi Sport GMT. This is a $2,500 dual-time watch, automatic winding, true mechanical this time. Last time I gave you a chronometer quartz. This time I'm giving you a mechanical wind dual-time, 100 meters water-resistant stainless steel, 44 millimeters in diameter with a sensational engine-turned silver dial. You can see this one with a stainless steel-like aesthetic about its dial, all applied in loomed indices. It even features a bi-directional rotating rubber-rimmed motorsport style bezel. I've actually got a review of this watch on the channel already, and as you can see, it has a discrete second time zone in a 24-hour format, and it is Audi Sport branded because there was a period from 2014 to 2016 during the tail eight or the tail of the Audi Le Mans program when Audi Sport and Oris were partners. Well, Audi continues in motorsports with the R8. They're no longer racing the prototypes, but the bottom line is even if you're not a motorsports fan, this is a hell of a lot of watch for the money, and it looks absolutely awesome. The all-applied Arabic numerals and the beautiful grained silver steel style dial really make this watch for me. And you know what? No nonsense. ETA 2836 dual time movement. A wonderful piece to get for free. I can't complain. It even has a full deployment clasp. Oris does not skimp. As you can see, this is a fully featured watch, leather strap, deployment clasp, dual time, mechanical. This is one you're going to want to win. So stay tuned to this channel because we're going to have the link up soon, probably on Wednesday's show. Absolute worst on Friday's show. Okay, I can see new friends joining. We have um, Yahia joining us from Egypt, and we have bump, 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 High and Rising saying that Oris Shore is a hell of a lot of watch for the money if you get it for free. That's right. It's a hell of a lot of watch, and actually, I'm going to show you a watch that you might not have expected going from the dual-time Oris Arctic Audi Sport GMT to the Devon Tread 2 Chronograph. We're heading from Holstein, Switzerland to... Pasadena, California. Now, I showed you the Tread 1 on last week's show. This is constant seconds mode with the Tread 2. As you can see, it's a jump hour, jump minute, jump second regulator, and it's a chronograph. I'm going to take it out of constant seconds mode. Now you can see that right now it is bump, 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 six, five, six, seven, six, oh, seven. It's red just like that. Two belts, two motors, optical sensor, thermocompensated quartz, seven to 14 day power reserve with a inductively charged lithium polymer battery. This one's unique because A, you can wear it on a human wrist. It's not as big as the original tread one. And two, it's the first Devon with a sapphire crystal. The original had such a large crystal. It had to be polycarbonate to avoid shattering. Now the watch has a chronograph function. I'm going to show you what happens when you turn it off too, because it also features a reserve de marche. Now, 12 is its default. It shows you how much power is left. It moves from 1 to 0. So right now, the index is right next to 9 or 0.9. So it's at 90% charge. Now, turn it back on. Wake it up. The motors are the same motors used in medical pumps. So life and death type stuff, these are high quality components. The motors come from medical technology. The belts come from aerospace gauges. And there are optical sensors so the watch knows where the belts are in relation to the indices. Let me show you the chronograph functionality, assuming I can time this perfectly. You push, you pull, now it's in chronograph mode. You press the button, the seconds start ticking away. The 12 represents zero. It is a zero to 12 minute chronograph, so it rolls over every 12 minutes. You can stop it with the trigger, you can resume it with the trigger, but if you want to reset it, you push the toggle down and now it resets to zero. And if you want to put it back into time telling mode, you push up and now we're back. And bump, 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 bump. you can see it is 609. Rolling along. I actually love the Devon watches, guys. They're great watches. They make about 1,000 to 1,500. They've got three watchmakers, I believe, working for them in Pasadena now. And the wonderful thing is, if you need anything, you call them, you get a human being on the line. That's it on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. I absolutely love this watch. I would absolutely buy one for myself. 
I like high horology, but I also like innovation, and that is it. Okay, bump, bump, bump. Jason Reeves saying, I am intrigued, and I can see DGB saying, too complicated, you need a PhD to understand it. It's digital. A kid could read this. It's 609, and in a few seconds, it's gonna be 610. And when it jumps, you'll read it that way. Very easy to read, super simple, and if you want constant seconds, you just hold it down, and now you've got constant seconds. Hold it down, and now you jump back, and it's 610. Okay, you're gonna love this. This is a great watch, guys. We're gonna have more Devon products on the show in the future. They're not sponsoring that spiel. That was my unqualified and unpaid endorsement. Bell & Ross, however, did send me watches to be on tonight's show, so I'm not gonna short you. In my left hand, you can see the Bell & Ross BR03. 92. This is a 42 millimeter full black ceramic watch. It's instrument style. We talked about the Devon using aerospace technology. This one uses aerospace imagery. You can see it's absolutely elemental. Quarter Arabics, high contrast, low glare, automatic winding. It's 100 meters water resistant, so this is actually a pretty versatile watch. I particularly like the fact that the strap is full width, so the watch isn't going to torque back and forth on your wrist. It's nicely planted, it's comfortable, and in ceramic, it has that long wearing durability, that near invulnerability to scratches that I adore about ceramic watches. Now that said, it's not the coolest Bell & Ross on the table tonight. That would be the 2018 Bell & Ross Experimental Series. BRX1. This is the RS18 RS for Renault Sport as the watch is part of a collaboration between Renault Sport Formula One team and Bell and Ross. It's in titanium, one of 250 pieces made like this. It actually has a chronometer grade balance and hairspring, so it's a very high grade watch internally and externally and exceptionally shall we call it exuberant and expressive timepiece? 45 millimeters and thoroughly realized. I want to emphasize that the rocker switches for the chronograph are actually counterbalanced by a small natural vulcanized rubber nook where you can use your thumb, brace your thumb, and then operate the rocker switches for the chronograph. I adore the fact that they actually thought this out, and the rocker switches not only look absolutely awesome with the rubber inserts that have an audio visual style start stop symbol. So if you remember the VCR or the DVD player, that's the imagery you'll get. But because the rockers are also shouldered, they provide protection for the crown as well as protection against cheering for the chronograph pushers themselves, which are underneath. The dial is open, but at the same time, it's a very easy dial to read. All applied numerals, Arabic style, means you can quickly read it day or night. The loom is superb. And the tachymeter scale is a timing instrument, but the rest of the dial is basically an homage to motorsports imagery. You have the white, the yellow, and the red that are simply ubiquitous trackside and everything from emergency vehicles to the yellow of the Renault Sport F1 cars themselves. This is a handsome and unusual take on watches from Bell & Ross. I love it. Right down to the strap itself, which is relieved, thin, supple, and vented. This is a nice piece. I have have to admit, this is a competitive offering from Bell & Ross, and ambitiously priced at that, I can't say for a fact that I would definitely pr prefer something like an Hublot Big Bang over this. I would actually take this over a Big Bang and a Unico at that, too. That's a fun piece. That, that's one of my favorite Bell & Ross models. If you haven't seen my video of the micro rotor tourbillon with the sapphire case, you really need to check that one out. That's also part of the Bell & Ross experimental series. Okay, B -b -b bump Mark S. Tim, will you always tell us if you were showing a watch because you were paid to or if the watch was sent in by the... Yeah, I'll always tell you. When I've got a sponsored watch on the show, I'll be open about it. Full disclosure, at Watchbox, we sell watches, so everything on the table is for sale. But if I have a manufacturer piece in there, like the Bell & Ross, I'm absolutely going to let you know that they sent it. And again, between the two, the BRO3 and the X1, I prefer the X1. Um, between those two and the Devon, I'm probably going with the American product. My preference, you know, is Jager LeCoult. Of everything on the table tonight, I'm probably going with this, the Zeitwerk, and the Patek Philippe Regulator. And I kind of spilled the beans. We have a Patek Philippe Regulator on the table tonight. This is another one of our pre-owned pieces, owned by the watch box. But in 2011, we first saw this watch, and and then nothing for two years. This was the application of the Advanced Research Series technologies, a regulator dial with an annual calendar aperture. So you have the day, you have the month, and you have the date. You have the hours, radial minutes at center, and then seconds at six o'clock. And 
Wonder of wonders, you have hacking seconds. Stop seconds on a regulator dial with a gorgeous silver steel-like vertical striation, the satin finish, and all blue printing with sunken subs, and you'll even note blue heat blued steel hands at center. Absolutely gorgeous. It gets better on the case back. Now, this is loosely based on the 240 micro rotor, but with big upgrades. First, it's a different movement. It's the 31260 REG, which means it's a regulator, it's a new caliber, micro rotor automatic. You note how the bridges have been redesigned compared to the 240 with a little bit of an echo of the old Geneva finger style bridges for the train wheels. You can see the barrel, you can see the great wheel. It's not the center wheel because it's off center. So the great wheel, the third wheel, the fourth wheel, and then underneath the escape wheel, the pallet, and the gyro max balance. And the cool thing about this watch is that as the production realization of the advanced research series, it has a silicon anti-magnetic hairspring. It has a silicon pallet. It has a silicon escape wheel. Everything about this, except Gyromax SI, which is not present for reliability's sake, comes from the Advanced Research Series. This is the production version of it. It beats away at a quirky beat rate. I may as well wind it fully. I feel bad. 23,075 vibrations per hour, and it has a 60-hour power reserve. Because of the micro rotor automatic, it is nice and slim. And if you note, the case is pulled straight from the vintage reference 3448, the case and the bezel, the lug profiles and the lines. A gorgeous watch. This is my favorite Patek. My favorite Patek at any price. And yes, I have worn and operated the Grandmaster Chime, the very top of the heap, the most complicated Patek wristwatch ever. I'd rather have this. It took them till 2013 to deliver the first of those watches. That's how tough it was for Patek to industrialize that. Two years from the time we first saw it to the halting initial attempts at delivery. Okay, bump, bump, bump. And I also want to add that it's not nearly the only Patek I've got on the table. Depending on whether you're a travel timer or an annual calendar type, one of these watches might be for you. Okay, in my right hand. Possibly the most loved modern Patek Philippe world time. This is the 5110J in yellow gold. 37 millimeters with crown guards. You can see it's a gorgeous timepiece with a sort of grand doge dial, a sort of barley corn guilloche pattern. And then outboard, you can see 24 reference cities for the 24 primary time zones. I'm using the New York time zone at 12 o'clock. You can see the index at 12 o'clock because I'm in Philadelphia. I'm on New York time. And then right next to it, you can see one of the stars of Basel World 2005, the Patek Philippe 5396R sector dial, discontinued in rose gold, 39 millimeter case. This reprises the aperture calendars from 1950s Patek Philippe perpetuals in an annual calendar format, absolutely gorgeous, foie or leaf style hands, blue calibrations with the sector dial. There's a lot going on here, but it never looks busy. Beautiful caliber 324 automatic on the case back. You'll note that the world time, the 5110, uses the micro rotor automatic. So these are the two basic Patek Philippe automatic calibers. You've got the 240 micro rotor, which is generally considered to be the premium automatic, and then you've got the 324 central rotor. Keep in mind, the 260 REG that you just saw on the regulator is a step up technologically from both of these. So just so I can illustrate how the 240 micro rotor really changed when it became the 31260 REG, let me show you the two of them side by side. You can see how much bigger the regulator movement is. It is far larger in diameter. It's also different in layout. You can see the bridges of the regulator look nothing like the 240. Big forward steps in both technology and design. This is going to be the next generation Patek Philippe micro rotor. It's going to start on the regulator and work its way out. Okay, so I can see comments coming through on some of these Pateks. All right. So High and Rising is commenting on the weird beat rate for the Patek. And he's saying 23,075 beats per hour on the Patek. 
It is a it is a quirky beat rate. It is it is its own thing. It's not 21.6 and it's not 28.8. Uh, there are two Pateks that have weird beat rates. One is that. The other is the Grandmaster Chime, which uses an Omega coaxial like 25,200 vibration per hour rate. All right. Now I've got a question about Longa. Well, we've got more Longa. It's not just the Zeitwerk. If you want the basic Longa that everyone knows and loves, the watch that helped to launch them, but you don't want the Longa one everyone's got, then you want a plus. Platinum Longa One Moon Phase. As you can see, it's everything the Longa One is. 38.5 millimeters platinum. You've got that same calculated quirk to the offset geometries of the complications and displays. And you've got the Moon Phase. Now, Longa Moon Phase discs or solid gold. And then there's a vapor deposit that creates the blue of the night sky on top of the solid gold. Turn it over. It's still a manual wind, double mainspring barrel movement, hand finished, perhaps even better than the Zeitwerks. You can see the traditions of longer movement finish here. You can see, I'm trying to wind this one up so you can see it in motion, and then I'll steady my hand so you can see the movement better. These are the cardinal traditions that define longer finish today. Unplated, nickel, copper, zinc, German, silver, golden hued, three quarter style bridge. So it doesn't have the broken bridges of a Swiss movement. It has the three quarter style bridges of a 19th century German pocket watch. It's not the rhodium plated, the silvered rhodium plated brass of a Swiss movement. This is unplated and thus golden hued. You can see the copper in the alloy of the German silver. Now getting close to the longer one again, you can also see that all of the jewels of the train are set in screw fixed chiton. So you pull those heat blued screws out and the entire jewel lifts out of the plate for easier maintenance, cleaning, and relubrication. Now, the reason they do this is because back during the pocket watch era, the manufacturing tolerances weren't quite as exact. So you couldn't quite machine the plates and the bridges as precisely. Instead, what you would do is you would create a chaton that would hold the jewel and then you would fix it into the plate using screws. And this is the old school fashion in which that's executed. You'll also note, if we can get a little bit closer to the balance half bridge right there, you can see balance half bridge, balance cock, whatever you call it, it's freehand engraved. That's not guilloche. That is engraving that removes material by means of a chisel and a hammer. It's done by hand, it's done by eye, no two are exactly the same. You'll also note black polish. There are heat blued screws, there are also polished screws, and you'll note larger black polished components in the form of the swan's neck regulator and the cover for the the escape wheel half bridge right there. And if I, I'm gonna see if I can turn it flush to the camera. You can see the glint and the gleam of the edge of the bridges when I turn flush to the camera. And that is the mirrored englage. There's not much of it because the bridges are spare, but what's there is executed as well as anything in Switzerland. All right, big brands, boutique brands. How about independent brands, FP Journe? Now, I have a question from Anthony O. Tim, why do manufacturers use jewels in their movements? Because traditionally, the use of a synthetic sapphire, which is what you're really looking at, what you're looking at is a material called corundum. And with different impurities, it can be a clear sapphire, it can be a blue sapphire, it can be a fake ruby. They're created using a process called the Vernoy process that was invented in the early 20th century, and this allowed basically fake stones, lab-grown stones, to be used on an industrial scale. But even before that, they would be made manually from real jewels because a metal pivot with lubricating oil in a jewel sink guaranteed low friction and long wearing durability. It was mainly a matter of ensuring that jewels that were set into the bridges and the plates would last the lifetime of the watch, thus several generations. So more than anything, it's for friction and, dur and durability. And the most standard hardness of those stones is nine. A diamond is 10, so you'll never have the metal pivot of the staff of the wheel aggressing and wearing down the jewel itself. The only way that can happen is if the lubricant degrades so much that some of the non-volatile components of the lubricant actually start working as an abrasive paste. Then you'll lose the staff and the jewel, which is why it is really important to service your watches, because that can happen in modern watches too and it generally happens in Rolex when a guy's like, I've had this Rolex for 30 years and it's never gone in for service. I'm like, you're boasting about that? Do you feed your kids? 
I mean, that's the kind of thing where you just know when that watch is opened, yeah, it's not losing time. It's going to be a horror show. Replacing everything from jewels to staffs, it's going to be expensive. Service your watches. Don't let them go longer than five years. Okay. A uh, question from a uh, comment from High and Rising. If I buy a Patek, they better use diamonds for jewels. Some companies do that. Some companies do, in fact, use diamond capstones. Check out tourbillon watches from, from Longa and Glossuta Original, and you'll see diamond capstones actually used for tourbillon. Okay. What should we talk about? How about a watch that is... Okay, there are two watches on the table here. The Bell & Ross is large because it's a function of attitude and image. This is large in charge, F1 inspired, and designed to be flamboyant for the sake of flamboyance. It's Mario Cipollini, it's Fernando Alonso, it's the emotion of sport at the highest level, whether it be cycling or F1. I, this is actually a pretty good match. Cipollini, of course, a uh, championship sprinter in cycling, famed for wearing outrageous outfits. That's the Bell & Ross. The IWC is functionally huge. This is a little bit more like Fabian Cancellara, and that's an appropriate analogy because he's an IWC ambassador. He was a Swiss time trial specialist who was also a king of the cycling classics, the big one-day races. 46 millimeters with a mechanical depth gauge, the 2009 IWC Aquatimer Deep 2 was the follow-up to 1999's Deep 1 mechanical depth gauge. So what you're looking at is a depth gauge with two small tabs. One is red, one is blue. The red is a memory system that will tell you down to 60 meters the maximum depth that you encountered on your dive. The blue tab that's adjacent to it will tell you the current depth that you've reached on your dive. There is a crown system with a cover on the opposite side. Let me see if I can shim it up with my cropped fingernails. And you can see that there's actually an aperture, a tri-aperture, within this crown that allows the water to enter the depth gauge mechanism. The crown itself also acts as a calibrating mechanism, so if you need to calibrate the depth, you can do so. So if it's reading positive or negative on the surface, before you dive, you can pre-calibrate it. And the cool thing is, as I back the depth indicator to its original location, I can press the reset for the memory, and you can see how that red tab shoots right back. So this is a functionally huge watch, 46 for a reason. There's a depth gauge inside, and you need to be able to see it. There's a lot more going on here, too. It features a quick-release system for the straps, so you can rapidly swap straps, dress it up or dress it down, and then the dial itself is oversized. There's a sapphire-capped bezel. The bezel is fully luminescent. You know what's really cool? so is the diving scale. I've actually got a video of this watch that I'm gonna take live in the next few days on my channel right here. The diving scale is completely luminescent, and the minute hand is a different color from the hour hand. The first 15 minutes of the bezel are a different color from the remaining 45, and the entire depth gauge glows green. It is sensational, and like a Blancpain 50 Fathoms, the sapphire cap of the bezel means it has a wonderful, lustrous, three-dimensional appearance, and the loom will never scratch off. I adore this watch. Okay, big watches and wrist chats. We're gonna do a few in succession so you can see how these watches actually wear. This is the 46 millimeter deep two diving, diving watch, depth gauge, memory system, it actually wears easy. For a 46, this is not a stretch. I could wear this and be comfortable. Okay, Bell & Ross BRX1 RS18, the Renault Sport 18, on my wrist. It's a 45 millimeter case. I measured at 53.6 lug to lug. If you like the look, it's gonna fit a small wrist. I think down to 14 and a half centimeters, you're good to go with this one. Okay, the Zeitwerk Striking. 44 and about one third millimeter. You can see this one is wearable, but it does splay out to about 52 and a half millimeters lug to lug. It's bigger than the standard Zeitwerk. If you wear this, people will notice. That's good or bad depending on your particular disposition. I'm not really an extrovert, but if people are asking me questions about my Zeitwerk, I would feel compelled to answer. It's always important if you wear a big flamboyant luxury watch to be a good ambassador for the luxury watch hobby. Too many folks cop an attitude when they wear a huge visible luxury timepiece and then inexplicably get pissed off when people want them to answer questions about it. As long as the first question isn't what does it cost, you need to do as luxury 
car. Luxury good owners in general need to do, for the sake of the hobby, bring new people into it by being friendly and approachable. If you're driving the supercar, if you're wearing this watch, be prepared to answer questions. And if you've got the car, you know, let kids sit in the driver's seat, take a picture, and let guys try on your watch. As long as they're not going to bolt with it, you want to be a good ambassador for the hobby. Okay. And, and I guess I should show you the Devon, too, right? Because some of you guys are joining us late. You haven't seen this thing. It's very wearable. It's big. It's stark. This is the Nightmare model. Not all of them are completely blacked out. But as you can see, scrolling minutes and jumping hours. Okay. When the dual-time FP Journ... Amro always keeps me on topic and on track and forces me to show all of the watches that are listed in the description. And Amro, I love you for that. Thank you. This is the FP Journe Chronomet Resonance. I should mention that we have special pricing for all the watches on the show tonight. So if you call in, mention that you saw it on the show. For all the high-end pieces tonight, we have special pricing. And it will only be available in connection with the show. If you're watching it recorded, call in and mention that you saw the watch on the show. If you're watching live and you want to call, text, or email, our guys do so. Now I'm going to show you how the system works, then I'm going to show you how the system synchronizes. Two balances, two escapements, two power reserves, two barrels, two drivetrains, and there's a small rack and pinion at center that moves the balances closer or farther apart, so the resonance effect, whereby parasitic losses radiate out and mutually synchronize. If one runs fast, the other will slow it down. If one slows down, the other will speed it up. The idea being that over about 10 minutes of constant running, they will couple themselves, resonance will take place, and then they will run in sync. The problem is the seconds hands might not be perfectly in sync by the time resonance takes effect. So there's a reset trigger that allows you to resync them once resonance has fully taken effect. Now this is the post 2010 Resonance 3. Resonance 1 was the original dial, symmetrical on both sides. They both looked like this with a brass movement. Resonance 2 was the symmetrical dial with a rose gold movement, and resonance three, which you see here, is the rose gold movement and the asymmetrical dial. FP thought, you know what, if you've got two separate independently settable dials, make one a 24-hour system with scrolling hours and minutes so you can use one as a GMT. A lot of folks prefer the first, some prefer the second. It's all down to how you feel about calculated chaos on your dial. Are you a dissonant type? Do you like jazz? Or are you the type who prefers the rigid symmetries of classically composed music? That's really going to influence whether you prefer the resonance 1 and 2 or the resonance 3. And I'm going to take her home with one from Le Sentier. In, well, in 1931, the very first reversal was created. It had a case not made by LeCoult. It had a movement not made by LeCoult. As a result, although it was a LeCoult product, it was subcontracted entirely. So they only wrote Reverso on the dial. Now in 2011, the Tribute to 1931 debuted, and in 2012, the model you see here launched in the Tribute to 1931 case. 7.6 millimeters thick, 46.6 millimeters lug to lug in white gold with a silver grained dial blue applique indices, and broadsword hands. This is the Grand Reverso 1931 white gold, a rarely seen boutique exclusive that came out at SIHH 2011. And although it looks a little bit like the boutique version of the Duo that came out in 2013, it's not. This is a special model. It's buff on its case back for customization. White gold, introduced in 2012, made for maybe 18 to 24 months. This is the first one that I've seen, so I'm going to be doing a video on this watch, and it's going to be my first encounter with it. I'm bringing it home with JLC. As you can see, this one, very thin and flat on the wrist, is absolutely gorgeous, timeless. And again, if you're that guy, you got to answer the questions when people start asking why it doesn't have a brand name on the dial. Be a good soldier and haul the iron, or I should say, the white gold for the rest of us. Guys, remember, we're going to be giving away this Oris Artix Audi Sport GMT. I love Oris and I love Audi. I'm disqualified, though. I can't enter. You can. Probably this week, I would say either tomorrow with Brian or Friday with Josh and Jason, we're going to get a link up in the description fields for these videos, and we're going to make it easy for you to sign up for the raffle and get yourself waiting points by 
interacting with our social media so that the more you interact with our Instagram, our Facebook, and my videos here on YouTube, the better your chance of being drawn in the ultimate raffle. A gorgeous 44 millimeter dual time automatic that can also swim. This is the Oris Arctic Audi Sport GMT and it just might be your next watch. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate everyone who chimed in from around the world. You make the best job in the world possible for me. Thank you to my crew. Thank you to you. This has been Watchbox Reviews and Watches Live. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on. Mm -hmm.